Okay, all right, thank you. And we should have a sign in sheet as well for everyone. Uh, do, do you have a pen by any chance? I do. And I'll get a sign in sheet. Here I was all casual and I was supposed to start a minute ago. Um, I'm Paula Asher from Columbia Gorge Community College. Anybody know where the gorge is? <laughs> no, they know where it is. <laughs> so um, I'm here with Bruce Wolcott from um, Belmont Community College in Washington and Monica uh, Marlowe from Portland Community College. And uh, I'm and we're glad to be here, and uh, we've never done this before. Well, Bruce has, but um, so what could possibly go wrong, right? So Bruce is going to give you a little overview um, of some of the work he's been doing at Bellevue College, and then um, Monica's going to talk a little bit about what's happening at PCC, and then we're going to uh, solicit you to join our VR group that meets online, and uh, it's a... Um, Last time we talked, we decided it was low effort, high return, right? Yes. Those are the best kind of groups, right? And um, then we're going to try to uh, get quickly to the experience of you guys trying some Oculus headsets. We're going to try to go and quest. We have six of them, so we're going to break up into three groups, and we'll just kind of, you know, um, go from there. And um, because they, they, I mean, we really feel like the demo is an important part, because we were at one of our meetings and um, somebody said talking about VR is like singing about architecture. So we want to get into kind of the demo. So, the way Bruce. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Bruce Wolcott. I'm uh, uh, current, I've been teaching at uh, Bellevue College um, for about 22 years. Uh, I'd like to point out my colleague at Bellevue College, Ron Austin, who's uh, instructional design lead uh, and also is uh, doing the administration work for the XR lab which is where I'm currently working. I teach in the communication studies program there and uh, work with the e-learning center as well. Um, today uh, we have an hour and so what we're going to be taking a look at, first of all I'm going to just talk about this term XR, you're probably going why XR right? and. Um, what, how does that relate to virtual reality technologies? And I'll explain that uh, briefly. Uh, we're also going to be looking at, uh, Monaco and myself will be looking at how we are beginning to implement VR into uh, classes and into uh, the institutions where we're working. And uh, Paula as well, she's doing a lot of work in that direction. Uh, also, as uh, Paula mentioned, we uh, have set up a um, low effort, high return um, group uh, called the um, uh, Northwest XR uh, Network, uh, Educational Network. And uh, the idea is that we, as schools get involved with VR, that we have a place of, of shared information and where people can go and, and find out what's happening and what other institutions are doing. 
um, as you move forward. And then we have uh, some VR demos that uh, are available. We have six headsets and we'll be going moving through and you'll have a chance to try out uh, VR for yourself. So let's talk very quickly about what, what we mean when we say virtual reality. And virtual reality actually, you'll see these uh, abbreviations, AR, VR, MR, XR. What is all that, right? Um, well, there's a virtuality continuum, right? We have the real world where we are, uh, augmented reality. We have an example of augmented reality over here where you take a, 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 a virtual object and put it into the real world. Um, augmented virtual reality, um, virtuality is where you, the, you have real world objects like tables and uh, you have a, a um, virtual uh, map put over it, say you're creating a medieval scene and this table looks medieval in VR but it's just a regular table in the real world, right? So that uh, skin is mapped on that. And virtual reality, which is really where you're transported to another location, uh, and those are the kinds of experiences that you'll have this morning. So there's the real world reality, virtual reality where you're taken to another location. Augmented reality, in this case, this is Minecraft, uh, which is a Microsoft product. He's using a HoloLens, which, where he's actually looking at the real world, but the Minecraft um, objects and environment are projected into the real world. And, and they're, they're extremely clear. We're not talking about kind of ghosty images showing up. They look like the real thing, right? Uh, integrated into the real world. Uh, augmented uh, virtuality um, is rarer, and I, uh, all I can say a good place is to, place to look for this. One place is the Pacific Science Center in uh, Seattle, uh, where you go through a fictional universe inhabited with dwarves and uh, walls that have skins put on them and blowing fans and all that. So we have um, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and the whole spectrum taken together is called XR. That's what that refers to. Okay, so very briefly, what's, uh, what, how this works is uh, the older systems uh, had light, what were called lighthouses. You put on the headset, you'd use a, a pair of um, controllers, and the light boxes would record your movements. As you move, it would be recorded and uh, transmitted via the headset and the, the controllers. These new headsets, which have only been out, which are called inside-out tracking, they've only been out less than a year. Um, the computation and the tracking and everything is built into the headset, so you don't have a tether that's hooking the headset to a computer. And they, these are really revolutionary because in terms of flexibility, being able to bring classes in, have them try out experiences, uh, this has been a real uh, game changer for uh, the work that we're doing at Bellevue College. It was a real big movement forward. Um, some key ideas, the ability to interact with the virtual environment is important because it adds uh, real-time learning involved with being within a virtual environment. Immersion refers actually to the ability of the technology itself to realistically portray um, a virtual environment to the senses. And presence is actually this feeling that we have right now where we feel present in this room, right? We feel we have an actual sense of being here versus looking, say, through a screen, which is more like looking at a window to another reality. Okay, so uh, just very quickly, one of the things that was a real key point for us at Bellevue College as we move forward and was, began exploring this territory was the XR lab is located in the library. What the tendency has been for most schools when they get VR equipment is that the equipment ends up in computer science, it ends up in uh, the art department, it ends up within a specific location within the campus, and it's sequestered there. Being in the library, is the VR then becomes a resource for the entire campus. And the benefit from that is then you get this crosstalk between disciplines. A lot of people can use VR for a lot of different kinds of things, whether it's math or physics or it's literature or it's uh, uh, art, sculpturing. Uh, there's a lot of different di architecture, interior design. All of those are uh, very useful. So 
the library and having a core place where uh, people can come and learn how to use the technology and you have some people who are staffed and committed to helping people learn about it and identify what programs are going to work well for different departments. That's really much, this is pretty much the same function of, as librarians, right? It's a library function. And that's been very helpful for us. We're working with faculty, um, getting them accustomed uh, so that they know what programs will work well with what they're teaching. Uh, we're working with students, both in terms of the student club and uh, bringing students in who are just interested in VR and want to try it out. Uh, another really important thing and something that we're hoping we'll, we'll be able to try out uh, with uh, some of you this afternoon or during the day um, is this idea that VR is not just disappearing into a cocoon. The direction, uh, and Nate, right? Uh, Nate's we've been working a lot with um, a VR uh, shared environment, collaborative environment. In, I don't know anybody who knows it as well as you do, but this idea that you can get together in a collaborative workspace and build stuff and share ideas is a very important direction where all of this is going, that you can begin collaborating with people all over the planet within these uh, virtual environments. I'm sorry, so, I'm having, excuse me, I need to raise my hand real quick. We're having a fangirl moment because we just realized that you're putting out Nate in the room. And we've actually never physically met him, but we super loved his Pokemon world. <laughs> <laughs> it's so okay, go back. Okay, sorry. There you go. Um, anyway, the key question, of course, for everybody getting started in this, and as we were starting at Bellevue College three years ago, is they're saying, "Wow, this is this is incredible technology." So. What are we doing with a video game parlor <laughs> at school? That was kind of, that's a lot of people's impression about what VR is about and that it's a very solitary type of experience. And I just want to clarify that if that was the case, we wouldn't be pursuing it right now. Uh, on the sheet that I passed out that's available for you, I just want to um, point out to this quote, which is uh, from Michael Abrush, chief scientist for Oculus Research. Uh, he said, I'm confident that VR will be a part of daily life for tens and then hundreds of millions of people uh, and will begin to change the way we work, the way we connect, and the way we live. And we're looking at this technology as going to have, as having an impact in education and, and being worthwhile for us to be getting involved with it at a ground level. And the time is really good right now, actually. This is, we were a little bit early getting started and had a lot of struggles. So anyway, that's... Um, so, Monica, I've got a question. Of, of where are we time-wise? Twelve minutes in. Twelve minutes in. Would it be okay if I run this this four-minute video? Sure. That work? Okay. This is um, this is an overview of the XR Lab and what we're doing. It's a short four-minute video. Stand by one second here. The volume turned down. Stand by. I love the idea of being able to pull human perception that we're comfortable with into new dimensions that exist beyond our planet. When you use virtual reality, you, in some meaningful sense, you're actually transporting yourself to another place. And so you're not remembering something that you saw from someone else's point of view. You're remembering a place that you went to. That feeling that it gives me, I realize, is the tip of the iceberg for what could possibly be available to anybody on the planet. 
even as designers, we have a hard time understanding the scale, the perception, and how a space is actually going to feel when you're in it. And our clients who are even have less training have even a harder time translating what they see on a piece of paper or a flat plan into what a finished space is going to be. So virtual reality is great because you can actually be in the space, move around it, and truly understand the big design scope, the scale of the space, and how all of that works together. We've worked with faculty from across the campus to run workshops where they bring their classes down and they use virtual reality to support whatever coursework they're doing. Nursing students learning about human biology by shrinking themselves down and floating down a blood vessel and seeing how the human body works from the inside. Let's take a look at the blood's most prominent cell, the red blood. We're also using it in Art 101, the instructor has used virtual tours of Machu Picchu, for instance, and other architectural spaces. Other programs are using it to, you know, for like oceanography and, you know, studying uh, sea life and what it'd be like to live on the ocean floor, those kinds of things. It's pretty neat. One of the really great things about VR and AR as an industry is that it, ha it is full of people from a whole range of different backgrounds. So. VR experiences are created by programmers working together with artists and scientists and uh, just basically people from any kind of background. Uh, this is an industry that needs storytellers just as much as it needs engineers. Virtuality is definitely uh, a burgeoning field in architecture right now. And in fact, all the big firms in Seattle, Gensler, and BB&J uh, all have virtual reality labs within their architecture exactly. firms at the moment. And as the price is coming down and the ease of using this is becoming more and more uh, accessible to anyone, it's going to become kind of like the industry standard. So it's a great emerging technology for our students to have the skills when they come into the workplace. Uh, it's certainly a great thing to have on your portfolio to get a job because if you know this now, you're going to know a lot more than really uh, experienced designers in the workplace because they grew up before these skills. This particular area is great for you. You've got all these companies that are very much invested in AR and VR, and what that means is you're right in the epicenter of all this talk and activity around AR and VR. So you're essentially you know, bathing in it. Bellevue College is a great place for students to immerse themselves in this new technology. And that's why we're very excited in bringing a lab that can be a place for the whole college community to bring these new technologies into our instruction. We envision the XR Lab as a place for emerging technology. The reason that we conceived of it to be in the library is because the library is a tech hub for the campus and the library can be a tech hub for the region. Because the XR Lab is housed in the library, all of these people across all of these different disciplines have equal access to this equipment and it's not kept to one group or the other, it's a shared uh, community. At Bellevue College we offer a course which is an introduction to virtual reality and what this course is all about is basically what is this technology, where has it come from, how is it being used today and where is it going to go in the future. This is a course that's open to students from any background um, and we love having a really diverse classroom uh, because this technology is likely to impact people in just about every job. If you'd like to get involved with what we're doing at the XR Lab, you can email us on xrlab at bellevuecollege.edu. That was great, Bruce. So James, I'm going to and works with Bruce uh, via a, a Fulbright scholarship um, that brings him here <coughs> annually, and that's part of how Bruce has kind of jumped ahead of probably most of the rest of us at this point in having this centrally located at his college. You know, he had some visionary support early on, and then also his vision to reach out to someone else who was uh, researching at the same time, and that's kind of our whole shtick here, is that we're looking for people to help share the Exploration. Thank you. I'm paying a quarter for that. I'm Monica Marlowe, and I work at Portland Community College. Um, <clears throat> my made-up title, because when you're doing emergent work, you can, is Imagineer, and I stole, borrowed, uh, inspired from Disney's Imagineers, of course, but it's an immersive education engineer, because I've been working in immersive spaces um, actively with faculty since 
2006, was it that late? I thought it was seven or, anyway, um, it's actually before then, uh, because we used to hang out and raid together in MMOs, um, but that was definitely not that academic. But it, it's, it's served to tell us uh, a bit of what we're doing now, I should say. So how many of you, I should ask uh, real quick, are instructors, faculty in the audience, people who work directly with students? Okay, wow, so half of you. And then technologists or folks that help faculty on their campuses. Administration that has the power to move things forward. I see some, yeah, I see some, I see some energy there. Okay, so no, that's good, because that means I think we've got a good mix of the right people in the room. Um, I want to say real quickly that this is my son, and he's only seven, but he's had a headset on for less than one hour of his life. I took this, I put this on him specifically to get this moment of wonder shot, because I see this on many people's faces when they go in to immersive media for the first time, and, and I love that moment, and I think that that's something strong that we can use. A little bit about my background, again, um, I'm a member of PCC's online uh, <clears throat> learning development team. Uh, I focus primarily on multimedia for, you know, there's not a lot of time or space in our budgets to look into immersive media quite yet, but it is definitely growing by the day, it almost feels like now with people reaching out with requests. Um, I also coordinate a special group of CATS, Oregon Community College's Distance Learning Association's Emergent Technology Work Group. And uh, we are open to all 17 community colleges in Oregon. Approximately half of us usually uh, participate by sending folks to the work group, but we disseminate what we find to all community colleges. I also teach uh, MM142, which is Intro to Augmented Reality, in, up on Cascade campus. I'm a gamer nerd at heart. And is there anyone else that paddle boards who might want to go at some point? I'm going to find you out there. I am. Um, so what OCCDLA is, is again, it's, the, it's a consortium, the closest thing we have in Oregon to uh, getting together to work on these problems as a group. Uh, we don't actually have a state level body to be able to help us fund what we find, but we do get some funds from workforce development. So we tend to find one college out of 17 who's willing to sign contracts and move forward as a consortium of the willing that way. Um, but other states around us, nearly everyone I think, have their state level uh, uh, offices that can help move these kinds of initiatives forward. So if you're thinking about these things, um, <clears throat> this is probably a good time to reach out to those administrative folks that may have a little bit of power to guide how this blooms on your campus. <clears throat> Here at our campus, uh, PCC, uh, what we've got going on right now is that we do have some curriculum in the development pipeline for students who want to learn how to do this stuff. Um, we've got individual departments exploring uh, what it means to bring immersive technology into their curriculum. Not a lot of individual classes yet, like I haven't had a lot of faculty raising their hands saying, I want this, but I've got um, subject area committees and faculty coming together seeing this coming down the pipeline and they're either a little bit afraid because they don't know what's coming and they just want to make sure that they're not being hit like deer in the headlights or they're proactively looking for places where they can find other people again to work with them because it's such a big problem to take on. Um, library planning is happening at PCC but we are one of those institutions that started down in the departments and so it's been a little bit more difficult for us to gain access to curriculum outside of say multimedia or sonic arts where uh, students are working. So we're student-centric, which is good, but it also has meant that it's made it a little more difficult for, say, anatomy and physiology to come on board. <clears throat> and then um, we are always connecting to job opportunities for PCC students, and Portland is another hub like uh, the Seattle area, so we're uh, blessed in that way that we can get some folks doing things, hopefully the way we would like for everyone to be doing them from the get-go, which is Universal design for access, I'm sure you guys are using universal design, um, should also be access to design universally so that we get everybody's voice from the get-go in here. And that's part of why we're doing the work that we do. And especially, I think, um, you and James focused on democratizing access to development from the get-go. And when he talked about that last year at Northwest e and that kind of lit a fire in me thinking, well, my gosh, we're all working on the same problem, so let's do this together, right? Thank goodness everybody was on board and available to do this. So we have our little group of folks that meet online about once every six to eight weeks at this point. Again, it's a very low effort, high yield group, I think, for what you can get out of it. For example, um, 
Bellevue College is putting together some OER guides for faculty around subject areas. So if you are a technologist and you're looking on your campus for ways to either connect certain subject areas and or you've got subject areas coming to you, you may not have to do all of that research on your own. You may have some vetted content already possibly available. And we'd like to have everybody lean in and do a little bit of that work with us so that we're all sharing, uh, sharing the wealth as it explodes on, on our, our campuses. It's just coming so fast. So uh, Northwest XR Explorers Group, EDU, we really don't have a formal name yet. You guys could help us. Name. You can help us with that. With that, right? Um, ultimately, what we just want to make sure is we're like two minutes away from getting your hands on gear. Um, you guys all know that you now have a place to turn back to with us. We are happy to continue to make connections. We may not be the people that you need, but I'm pretty sure that we're one person away from someone in industry who could help answer a question to keep you moving forward in whatever you're doing. And so with that, I think it's time to get you guys up after we've talked to Ian for a few minutes. Any, Any questions? questions at this point? So I had a question that wasn't addressed yet, but how, I get the value of having a central hub for VR, but if I'm coming over at classes at 20, what's the magic number of VR headset to student ratio to keep them engaged? Because, I mean, I have a, I have a vibe at home, and it's entertaining to watch the people experience it. But if I'm doing a VR class, I can't have one person experiencing and everyone else just watching your image and what they're seeing. But right. that loses the wow factor. So what's the... Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something we um, had to work out over time because uh, uh, faculty are bringing in entire classrooms and that for certain experiences. But that's one format that we're working in. First of all, we have a room, uh, the room that we're using, the, the space that we're using, all the furniture is on wheels. So we're able to set up very quickly, set up like workstation areas. We're able to, we have a, like an informal conversation going on. We can set the chairs on wheels. We can have that with the presenter. We can break that down very quickly. And um, we've set sort of a general limit at about 24 students. Okay. And an hour seems to be, especially for students who are just beginning, the VR tends to be cognitively taxing. It's interesting and motivating, but uh, one hour and two at a very, a very high end, three experiences, two experiences is probably one or two experiences is usually enough. And so we'll do, first of all, we'll get a group of, say, say, it's, say it's 10 students, and I know it's 10 students ahead of time, I know what the applications are, I'll get uh, these headsets set up, I'll have five table locations, two students per location. And the reason for that is we've got one person looking out for the other, you know, the, for, first of all, I check and see who's already had experience. And then they'll be the people who will, will, will actually have a headset on to start off and kind of go be the so mentor for the other students. Hang on, who here has experience? Do you have experience with VR? So, look, we've got a good, okay, thank you. We're going to ask for help later. And so there, I did make a long story short, I'm sorry, I got a little bit involved. Uh, there are approaches to this that we've had to just learn by flying by the seat of our pants. And, and I, we can, yeah, any of those kinds of questions, we're happy to, to, you know, we have certain programs that we've developed, certain approaches, how to structure classes, and we're really happy to share it. I mean, that's part of our mission, really, is to uh, help other, other institutions that are getting involved, we can provide OER type support for them. But there are a variety of different strategies, but that's a key question right there, right, for bringing classes in. Yeah, Brian? Well, I was going to say we have about 15 to 19 people here, so let's see how <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. Right. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. It's the same experience, <laughs> right? right. Yeah, it's this is a little unusual because usually it's one person, you know, in the, you know uh, managing like a classroom. So we have actually three of us that are four of mine who wants to jump in too, um, to help you set up in the, the experience. Um, any other questions? Uh, just to let you know, what will be happening is we're, we'll be setting up in different parts of the room. Each of us has um, a Go and has a um, Quest headset. So we can take uh, two at a time, two or three at a time. And some of you will end up waiting a little bit, although we, I, I think we, can, we have some experiences that are fairly short. I think the goal this morning is just, if you haven't, especially if you haven't had an experience with VR, to get, get you an exposure to it. 
get the sense of what it feels like and that's probably the most important thing. I mean, if you haven't experienced it, then it, it's, it seems a little bit abstract, right? So um, I'm going to be setting up over here. And uh, let's see, Polly, you've got the back section yeah, there. Where did you want to set up? I've got right here. OK. For the we have hygiene shields. Are they going to um, Okay, wait. So I'm going to put one of these on because these are actually much easier to use in some way, but they feel that they're going to try two types if you're going to be uh, helping others with this. Hygiene shields. So one of the things about this technology is that we are getting pretty close to each other when you put something on your face. So, you know, you've got this. I know, this is so styling. And I have pictures of this on my already. It's fine. <laughs> so you can, you can wear this thing or... Um, They've already upgraded this experience for us, and we've got um, Velcro tabs on some of these where you can grab one of these and stick it on here. And then these little extra tabs on the sides here, there are accompanying Velcro spots on the mask. So once you lay this on, it on it. once you've got it on, it's a little less, a little less invasive. Uh, and more comfortable with your face than the texture of this one. But again, I've got plenty of them, and if, you, if you're a support person and you want to know, you know, like, this this might be, if you've got a lot of people you need to get to an experience quickly, it's, it doesn't feel as good, but there's, it's a lot less hassle, right? So you could, and you can hand everyone one out, and then they could use their own and, and keep it easily, whereas this needs to have something taken on and off. I know. Or you just run the shower. Or, you know, we do have, we have Lysol wipes, that's, that's, too. I never even think about it, really. I don't worry about it that much. But, um, but yeah, that's a good thing. All right, so who would like to try? So I don't have an office. I have five. But um, do you still measure your interpupillary distance? Is that something that they are concerned with or not with this kind of one? This one seems to be flexible enough to work on. I haven't had anyone complain. Um, the um, quest has a pupillary adjustment right on the bottom. So that's the off when I first went around because I was expecting the pupil like this to just this grab and go. That takes a, a moment of adjustment. So, all right. So make sure this is on. This is the go. So yeah. So this one's this one's the go. It's one ninety nine. It has one controller, um, and it only has four degrees of freedom, which means you can go forward, back, this way, up. You, there's no pitch or roll with it. Um, they add that with the Quest. And what's necessary is the second controller to give you uh, rotational data to be able to, to make that clear view, I guess. Um, all right, so this is on. And there's an experience called blue. There's an experience called blue. And I'm going to set up the interface so that you don't have to actually use uh, navigation because if you're new to the experience, it could be a little bit jarring to figure that part out. Yeah, so who wants to be my first victim? Yeah, let's get, um, get like a couple people, people back here. here. Let's get two, two or three back here. Yeah. There we are. We have three people. Okay, great. And then we'll have a few people up here. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then we'll have. Um, is that okay if we bring a couple people? Oh, of course. Okay, great. Those have two. Um, again, so we're really new about sharing these as well. So if you have a suggestion about the way that we can do the dynamics of this kind of presentation, we're all yours. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we can take a couple of volunteers up here. And then we even have room for two over here with uh, Monica and two over here with Bruce. There you are. You can just have you two come over here with Monica. And while you're waiting, we're passing around the augmented reality cube, which is super cool. So it changes to a brain, but the cube is only about twenty-five dollars, and the software that runs this is open source and it's free. Uh, and of course, the cube can be on the brain. So it's the uh, it would be good, and then you can have like um, 
every element you can interface over it. Like you see how you can have like text and your pointers and that type of thing. So it's really it's And I'll point this to the button? Yes. 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 Okay. And then once you go somewhere, you can figure out where on earth you are right? using the map. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. So if I like random, um, that takes you randomly to somewhere on earth. Okay. Um, well, the landscape hasn't changed. So should we go here? Let's see. Okay. You can go outside
I think 10 40. So you have 20 minutes. Hopefully it's worth it, and um, and you know, you're saying that, that we have equipment, you know, um, all day today and tomorrow. So, uh, if Monica's around, you'd probably be happy to. Oh, no problem. It's just whatever we can help. I'm sure you know. I'm sure you know. Yeah. Well, are you presenting? Yeah, uh, uh, 
The globally available. Oh, yeah, I really don't mean. No, it's too cool. I've got a little bit of the AR and the iPad, but it's just that state. You put it on the desk and you can move your pad around and see it. But to hold it, that's a totally different right, spin on it. Yeah, and it's so cool to still be impressed by well, it. Well, I've got to see it. Yeah, I did that one. Monica, do you have a map? Oh, uh, okay. Because I have my... It's back in my room. Okay. All right. I'll find some more. I, 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 yeah, I left mine in my office. <laughs> Sort of, you know, like the question about how many headsets do you need. We're just trying to get as many as we can. Yeah. We're trying to get the Quest. Yeah. I'm totally sold on it now. Me too. I, and I was a little bit. The, the one challenge to them now is they have kind of a restrictive, in terms of developer size. Mm -hmm. They're very restrictive in terms of, you know, the kinds of quality of stuff that's going to be. They want anything quality, but. That's, that's, you know, it's kind of a bottleneck for a lot of educational titles. This will change over time. But, um, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the only downside right now. So, oh, yeah, how much they cost? I say because you're not connected to the computer, so you're stuck with what you can get on it. You're like you can't run Steam on this because it's not connected. No, you yeah. can't run Steam. You can't run Steam titles. I see. Okay. They, they don't talk to each other. And Steam and Oculus are problematic anyway. Uh, yeah, it's it's not as easy as just going through. You know, so, but I'm totally sold on the Quest because the cost. And then, you know, and we picked up ten Quest headsets. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. And I was saying a hail Mary over that one. Right. <laughs> because. Uh, um, 
it had we really hadn't tested it. Sure. Um, but uh, it's been really great for the reason, like this question that we got up. What do you do when you get a classroom of students? You can't get everyone tethered onto a. Right. You know, onto a well, and then the cost of having a PC associated with every it gets great. We're trying to do a little bit of everything. So we yeah. want to get some of these. Trying to get some of the Vive Cosmos. Yeah. Just because it's the, as far as I can tell, the premium experience now. I haven't tried the index. Yeah, I just had a chance to try it. Uh, one of the students got one of them. Mm -hmm. Brought it in. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really good. Yeah, but I'm, I'm assuming the visual yeah. fidelity is amazing. So we have the next we people have to, coming in to right. set up. Yep. So, all right, but we'll 